This episode of AD History is brought to you by NordVPN. Have you ever wondered how a certain Roman building stood the test of time? Or if there's more to the Kama Sutra than you might think at first? Well, have we got a story for you. This is the AD History Podcast. Weaving a tapestry of world history from 1 AD to HD. Powered by TGNR. Get your good news that's real news at TGNR by visiting tgnreview.com. Now here are your hosts, Paul K. DiCostanzo and Patrick Foote. And brought to you via London and New York City, you are listening to the AD History Podcast. I am Paul K. DiCostanzo and I'm joined by my co-host, Patrick Foote. Patrick, episode two, season two. Here we are. It's good to see you today. It's great to see you too, Paul. How have you been doing? I have no complaints in an age where there's plenty to complain about, so <laughs> I'm doing good. Yeah. What about yourself? I, I, I'm doing okay, you know. Uh, you're quite right. This is the age of complaining. There's a lot to complain about, but we're not particularly worried about uh, what's going on right now. We can worry about what's going on right now way, way, way down the line. But Paul, uh, today, in this edition of AD History... You are giving us a reason to have that explicit rating on the podcast, if I may say so myself. What are you talking about today, Paul? Well, depending on who you ask, uh, that may be true. So, well, of course, with his 111 AD to 120 AD, and for our first segment, I'm going to be going into the history, or rather histories, of the Kama Sutra. So now let's take a moment to hear from our sponsor for today's episode, Nord VPN. You know, the internet is a lot like ancient Rome, full of exciting scenes and brand new discoveries. However, ancient Rome is also a dangerous place, full of surprise attacks and a constant barrage of betrayals. You wouldn't explore ancient Rome without any form of protection, and you shouldn't explore the World Wide Web without any form of protection either. With Nord VPN on your device, you'll be protected from anything the internet may throw at you. Not all internet connections are made equal. Some public Wi-Fi spots don't have anywhere near as much security as others, meaning by connecting to them you are at legitimate risk of anybody being able to access your private data and information. By logging onto one of Nord's secure servers, your data is protected, and Nord performs no data logging. Their military-grade encryption puts the Roman legion's tortoise formation to shame, and your data will never have to be where the Ides of March. Nord's simple, clean design makes it super quick and easy to set up, use, and understand. And should you run into any issues, NordVPN's 24-7 customer support will be at the ready to lend a hand. And if you still aren't happy, Nord has a 30-day money-back guarantee. Nord doesn't only offer you security, it lets you bypass restrictions that may be put in place on the internet in your home nation. If you're campaigning in Gaul and missing the luxuries of Rome's internet, simply connect to one of their servers in Italy and you'll be browsing like you never left the Colosseum. Nord even works in countries with tighter internet restrictions like China, the United Arab Emirates and Saudi Arabia. And truth be told guys, I've been using NordVPN for almost two years now. As someone who professionally works with a number of content management systems, in addition to my own personal activity, online safety and security is paramount and non-negotiable. In my experience, NordVPN has earned my confidence and trust over tenfold in that time, providing me with outstanding protection online. In addition to its ease of use, Nord is available for Windows, macOS, iOS, and Android. And now with the ability to connect up to six devices, I've insisted every member of my immediate family use NordVPN, and they absolutely love it. So not only do I trust Nord to protect my professional endeavors, but also something far more important, my family. NordVPN is offering listeners of AD History the fantastic deal of 68% off a two-year plan and an extra month for free by visiting nordvpn.com slash history and by using the code ADHistory, all caps, no spaces, which will all be linked in the description. So don't be like Julius Caesar and cover your back with NordVPN. With Nord's 30-day money-back guarantee, it is an absolute no-brainer. Once again, that's nordvpn.com slash history and code AD history, 
all caps, no spaces. Thank you once again to NordVPN for sponsoring this episode of the AD History Podcast. Let's lay down our necessary, obligatory, now legendary AD History Podcast ground rules. One, evaluate events in the context they occur. Two, over the span of recorded history, the way it was recorded, its methodology, and the facts that are and were important have changed immensely. How we view history today is not necessarily how we viewed it even 50 years ago. 3. Nothing in history was inevitable. And 4. History and the past is like a different country. I have the floor. So, when we're talking about the Kama Sutra, yes, to an extent, Patrick, you're absolutely correct. This is one of the reasons that we carry the explicit tag on the AD History Podcast, because history can be pretty explicit, and we got to give ourselves a little bit of little bit of space to work with, wouldn't you say? Yeah, yeah, a little bit of wiggle room. Yeah. And there's absolutely. a lot of wiggle room in the Kama Sutra, but of chin. <laughs> <laughs> No, this is going to be a very adult, very mature look at a very interesting piece of early Gupta Empire, depending on when you date it, and also Western history as well. Because like I said, this is not the history of the Kama Sutra. It is really the histories of the Kama Sutras. And so for all intents and purposes, I think it is best to set the scene. In the 19th century, there was a very famous explorer, orientalist, adventurer, translator that has really gone into history as one of the more interesting figures of the Victorian era. And of course, I'm talking about Sir Richard Burton. And Richard Burton is a very interesting guy for a lot of reasons. He has done, he did more in a year than, than some people will do in their entire lives. And some of his exploits, in addition to what I mentioned, is he was also a spy. And in addition to being an epic traveler and adventurer, he had an inc- he was incredibly drawn to Eastern culture. And just to kind of give you a little idea about who the man was, this was a guy who actually, in, in fact, got kicked out of Trinity College, Oxford, for which when it happened, I believe it had to do with a steeplechase. I, I don't even know what that is. But it had to do with skipping class for a steeplechase. But when he went in front of the the board that was disciplining him, he wished them all very well, and he went on his merry way. And so, like I said, he was very much drawn to this Eastern culture. Why? Well, I'm sure there are many reasons, but to give you one of the heights of it is exploits. He was so intrigued by Islam that he made up an entire Muslim fake identity for himself so he could go and take the pilgrimage to Mecca. I think for all intents and purposes, ballsiness we're talking about here with this man. And it's really, really quite incredible. And he did this in a number of places in a number of ways. But what he's best known for is in the 1880s, he found what is the, in its original Sanskrit, transcript of the Kama Sutra. And he managed to translate this. And another interesting fact about Burton, and indeed, is he spoke over 25 languages. <laughs> he, he apparently was able to, to read, write, and speak Greek by the time he was four. And apparently, how, God only knows how much this is. This is legend and myth. He was, he was able to beat, by something like the age of 10, any opponent while playing chess blindfolded, which is... <laughs> A, a neat party trick, to say the least. Do you know what the word is for someone who can speak multiple languages? That would be a uh, multilingual? An omniglot. An omniglot. That's yeah, a fun see, word I wanted to Name share. explain, explaining them <laughs> names. It just, it never leaves them. It yes, never leaves like, them. It, have it, to get it, out my system. <laughs> oh, yeah, absolutely. It, it's the beauty of working with you, Patrick. Well, in any case, he finds it and he manages to get it tra- transcribed, but he has a little issue. And the fact of the matter is that for him to do that in England in 1883, and then later I believe he was actually did it in 1886, the law was very stringent on this matter, uh, specifically due to the UK's Obscene Publications Act 
1857. Have you ever heard of this particular law, Patrick? Not that one per se, but and and, and this is really getting as I explain the rating. There's always laws like this brewing about in the UK. Um, up until I think a few years back, there was like there was some sort of online adult ban law trying to become effect maybe it did become effect i'm not sure but it's the verification of 18 years old right yes and that was a specific uk based thing as well i believe um yeah the uk government always trying to hide our good stuff <laughs> this seems to be a a common struggle <laughs> for <laughs> both of yeah. us yeah definitely always hiding the good stuff always hiding the good stuff <laughs> well in any case so naturally he nor his his partner and they're both orientalists in fact they both decided to create a somewhat secret society, a society known as the Kama Shastra Society. And the idea here was that they would only print translated transcripts for those who are part of the society. So they were technically subscribing to it. I'm not exactly sure how that gets around the law, but I get the feeling the idea is that if you were vouched for because it was a society that you couldn't just join just because you wanted to, I'm sure there was probably some confidence in the fact that you would do everything possible to keep this out of the hands of people it doesn't belong in. Do, are you thinking along the same lines here, Patrick? Yes, no, definitely. Yeah, uh, very much like the stonecutters is coming to mind. Yeah, it, well, yes, absolutely. <laughs> this is interesting because Richard Burton has another aspect to his personality, which is he had an incredible interest in sexuality. And so you're in this case, you were very much putting together two pieces of the pie. One is the fellow who's the, the, the noted Orientalist, as they called them at the time, and one of the aspects that he was so interested in. It began what really became our history of the Kama Sutra, which is to say focusing in on exactly one book of, I believe it was seven books, which would be book two which is the the very exotic sexual positions that everybody, you know, for the most part over the age of 13 has probably stumbled across at some point in their life. And it kind of makes sense in a way. I mean, this really became the case in the age of the internet, to be sure. It was the most explicit part of it. There are, interestingly enough, illustrations, even though in the original Sanskrit text, no, no such thing exists. And in researching this, I definitely came across a few interviews with a variety of Hindu scholars, especially from that era. And at the end of the interview, all of them are almost borderline exasperated. And the reason that they're so exasperated is we literally have thousands of years of beautifully developed culture, and this is what the world knows. <laughs> mm, it's, it's so true. Like Everyone's heard of the Karma Sutra. Everyone thinks it's just that book of the book of sexual positions. When I told my girlfriend that that's what you're covering today, she was like, huh? I was like, no, 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 it's more than that. So it just goes to show you how universally known the Kama Sutra is just for this one reason. And like you said, it is, it is in some way kind of, I don't know if disrespectful is the right word, but it's just not fair that this entire culture and history is known for just this one, one section of a book. Yeah, it is. And it, it is extremely unfortunate. No, it's not fair. Unfortunately, culture is seldom fair. But it is deeply unfortunate, to say the least, because mm. it offers so much. With that aside, that's largely how people know about it today. And I have, I have had similar discussions. I had one with my wife on the same subject. <laughs> so, and she's very learned. You know, she's very smart, just, just like your girlfriend. And this is what they know, because this is what's in, in the mainstream thought. But it's so much more than that. And so when we start getting into dating of when the Kama Sutra began to be written... There's a wide variety, but consensus generally dictates that it was penned circa the early 2nd century, just when you and I are talking about right now. So more than adequate for our purposes, to be sure. Mm, mm. And in this case, it was written by an Indian philosopher, Vatasyana Malanaga. And with this in mind, this begins the second history, which in truth is actually the first century, but I figured we'd start with the part that people know and is most relevant to them. So let's break it down. Two words, kama and sutra. Kama, in, in this context, means the pleasure of the senses. So I think we all pretty much got that part. Mm. But sutra is a little bit more interesting regarding 
what this text actually is, which is it's basically a pearl or nugget of knowledge. So when we're talking about the Kama Sutra, sutras were extremely popular around this time, what we consider the early Gupta period, or slightly pre-Gupta period, depending on how you want to date it. There were a great many sutras at the time that were being written on many, many different subjects, might I add. In this case, this gentleman was writing about writing a sutra for what is available in terms of the physical pleasure. So as I mentioned earlier, it was originally penned in Sanskrit, and it was definitely meant for a male audience. It was a sutra that that sought to provide an overview, I would say, of, of what we might call the earthly pleasures. It's composed of, like I said, seven books, and the work is effectively a guide. And like I mentioned, these are all well, very, very popular at the time. This just happens to be one of them. And the Kama Sutra itself it is believed to have been largely based on a number of prior Vedic texts, which for the benefit of the reader, is just being boiled down into a far more digestible form. Something that is not a bad thing. You know, a Reader's Digest version can be helpful. And given, from what I understand, the, the numerous sources that ended up getting boiled down into the Kama Sutra, the author was most certainly doing the reader a favor, as he was doing a lot of archiving, a lot of research to even mm -hmm. make this particular sutra possible. It's basically like I mentioned earlier, because it, it's meant for the male audience. It's about physical pleasure, knowing what's available. But here is the caveat, Patrick, is that even though the author is making clear who this is for and what it's all about, the author is also not necessarily advocating any of it, which is interesting. It, it takes a very kind of third party, a, a, as objective as possible, look at these things. And in the case of the, the greater hierarchy of the various principles that are very, very important to Hindu spiritual life, he makes clear that, that Kama, in this case, the earthly pleasures, is subordinate to both Dharma, which we've spoken about before, which is right order, the order of the universe, as we will, as well as Artha, which in this case is the, the collection of wealth. Yet it emphasizes that as a younger man, the principle of Kama is, rel is of relatively greater importance to younger fellows because, well, they're younger and they're going to invariably be, in all likelihood, more sexually active, taking a wife, things of that nature. And so in the case of the Kama Sutra, we know what the second book covers, but what do the other six generally cover? Well, here's a nice bullet point for you. Foreplay how to manage marriage, managing mistresses and concubines, courtesans, adultery, as you can imagine, <laughs> and, and a variety of, of different kind of loves. In this case, very much having to do with, it almost somewhat balances both pleasure and genuine romantic love. So in this case, what the Greeks would have called eros, if you will. It seeks to create a, a situation of shared multiple pleasures fully, and it, interestingly enough, is not only for the male in this situation. So one of the things that the author, the author definitely emphasizes in all of this is that he's definitely going for shared pleasure in every way you can imagine. He's not thinking of just the man in this case. So the, there are definitely parts of the, of the book where he's at, you know, he's very much addressing newlywed men, where there's a chance that they did not even know their wife before they became married. So it's basically speed dating on speed, if you will. <laughs> and just how to begin knowing each other, understanding each other, and kind of working their way into what is sexual intercourse. And I think that's really very interesting because I think the, the outright assumption would be, I don't know about you, Patrick, that this would be entirely something that would be focused on men and their pleasure. But I think it's kind of an interesting thing that it's not, wouldn't you say? It really is, Paul. Um, we, have this impression, we have this impression that in this period of history and just in the majority of history, we have this image that women were more or less not really actual citizens and they would just... 
wives to men or mothers to men or daughters to men so often in history women get portrayed as just these attachments to men and they have to do what men tell them to do but here we're seeing such a different side of things and yes while this book was aimed at the young man the affluent young man how to be a gentleman we still get books like that today oh yeah it, it, it shows that the woman the women were being considered for and that is fascinating that it is so far back in history the role of women in in the bedroom it wasn't just i mean over here we have that classic victorian saying of oh, close your eyes and think of england that's what women uh, were told yeah. yeah i believe that was queen victoria who originated that right <laughs> yeah yeah exactly and that was the role women made in the bedroom but here saying you know they have just as much right to experience and enjoy this as men do and that's that's fascinating to read that's for sure and though i wouldn't say that the, the Kama Sutra would by any means conform to modern sensibilities no. as, as we understand them today. And, uh, and you can't look at it that way, of course, because history is like a different country. And this is a very different country. We're talking nearly 2,000 years, well, 1,900 years, really. We're talking about the Indian subcontinent. And though Hinduism and the, and the, the various cultures that exist today on the subcontinent are not by any means ridiculously foreign to most people, it still is something that does need to be pointed out, even though we have very thoughtful listeners who, who understand exactly where we're coming from. This book is compiled, and it has a lot of different aspects to it that I think are worth exploring. And I think you got a few questions for me that we can kind of kick that part of it off with. So, yeah, my first question is, what is actually known about the author? And Paul, I won't lie to you, I'm not even going to attempt to say that name. You did it perfectly. Oh, that that is an absolute exaggeration. Flattery will get you everywhere. <laughs> but as well, is there anything more known about this guy other than th this book he wrote? That is probably one of the more interesting mysteries of the Kama Sutra. And the reason I say that is because, in fact, very little is known about this fellow. We understand that he's an Indian philosopher, possibly involved in religious aspects of Hindu life at the time. We seem to know his name, and we have a pretty good idea of why he wrote it. But for the most part, not a heck of a lot beyond that is really known about him. I don't know if he authored any other pieces that have been uncovered, but good Lord, did, did he write something that had an incredibly long-lasting impact? It's strange because I think he'd be very, well, I don't think he'd be surprised, but I think he would be genuinely befuddled to see the one part of the book that had managed to reach the wider world, even though at this time it's also available in parts of the world that he may not have known existed at that point, just given we hadn't really come to the Americas for, uh, for quite some time yet. Mm. So no, not a heck of a lot is known about him, and it definitely is one of the more interesting mysteries of the Kama Sutra, to be sure. Yeah, and it just is so gosh darn interesting to hear that. Like, this guy, like, if we just wrote it, and like you said, these were popular at the time. There's probably like a thousand other ones like it published, but this is just the one we found. Who knows how many other Kama Sutra-esque books there were knocking about at the time, but uh, just something I found interesting. And despite we have a vague idea of we know who his intended audience was, who would this text be most useful to in the general era it was written in, do you reckon? So that's an interesting question. So the fact that it was written in Sanskrit tells us actually a, a fair amount about who the intended audience or very, very much the, the audience who could take it in would be. Because Sanskrit, as I understand it, is something of a, an elite language, which is say not every man about town wherever his place was in society, would necessarily have been able to read Sanskrit. So you have to imagine that it mostly came into possession. It was most useful to those who were literate in Sanskrit, which undoubtedly was wealthier classes of the society at the time that it was written. It also tells you a little bit more about the author as well, because it does tell you that he was also extremely learned. Not that that isn't terribly obvious based on what he managed to compile, but for the most part, if you could read Sanskrit, as I understand it, at the time, you were probably fairly well off monetarily, simply because you could afford various forms of higher education, which go a long way. This is slightly off tangent, but sure. 
I, I through through my work with radio, through my work with name explain even I've talked about affluent languages in the past and especially Latin Latin's a prime example I guess the Latin might be somewhat like the western version of Sanskrit to have this language that is only available to the elitist that is it's a, it's a concept that I guess doesn't really exist today you know m you know most people like, say here in England if you're posh or if you're not posh you still speak the same language of English it might sound different different dialect different accent kind of different words but it's the same but to have a language blocked off just for the elite to know the elite the posh upper tiers of society to know is damn fascinating this is just a slight tangent um it's a very interesting one i'm glad you brought it up <laughs> no and it's just one of my favorite people in history is martin luther and that's that's way down the line but <laughs> uh, one yeah of, fiery one the, figure yeah one of the things uh, he did was somewhat create the the modern german language is today because at that time germany was all these different tribes splintered kind of spoke the same language various and, kingdoms and whatnot mm -hmm. and the thing was the bible at that time was only written in latin and the common person couldn't read latin so it had to be read by the priests and the monks who could read it and this is what could be so interpreted Pe martin luther wanted people to just get to the core of christianity and read the bible for themselves but Instead, we had all these priests saying, no, no, this is what the Bible says. Believe me, you can't read the Bible. I promise you, this is what it says. This is what it says. And of course, the priests were adapting it and changing it in different ways. And it, it just reminded me of that to hear that this language cut off to the common people could be controlled in this way. It's just an absolutely fascinating, fascinating subject. And it's interesting to see it here. And like I said, a bit of a tangent. No, no, no. If I briefly continue on that tangent, it's interesting you bring up Martin Luther and the concept of Latin dominating scripture because as you were saying, only the priests could interpret the Latin. Mm. And one of the big aspects of Martin Luther's movement and the Protestant Reformation was both making sure that these texts were translated into the, the spoken and written language of many, many different people, which is a huge thing at the time. He was also really taken by the invention of the printing press. I believe mm. his his rough quote was, you know, it, it will allow everybody to read it in their language and we can finally create a common brotherhood of Christianity, which was a beautiful idea in his in his view. And I think in the abstract, I don't think anybody would have any issue with that. But it's interesting because, yeah, absolutely having that elite language that the laity, specifically in regards to the pre-Protestant Reformation Roman Catholic Church very much made sure that the the literate in Latin priests were the only ones who could extol that word. Mm. And I find that very, very fascinating and certainly relevant here. It kind of brings us into a, an interesting and different point because we're talking about how how does this all fit in the context of the world that it happens, right? What does this work say about very, very early Gupta, slightly pre-Gupta empire period society of India where, where this was written? And this is the thing that I take from it that's fascinating, is that it tells us a great deal that for that society within Hinduism as it existed at the time, that while sex was very much a, a private thing, it was not something that was forbidden to be explored. That mm. it was it was a topic that could be reasonably addressed, and I do find that interesting because we always think about sometimes how prudish people can be in the past, and that's only true up to an extent and in, in, in certain areas of the world, and that's definitely not the case here. Mm. To the point in which you have a very respected member of society writing, basically what I call a Reader's Digest version of what this is all about, <laughs> and for what probably in in actuality was. Uh, largely written by the upper crust of, of its society at the time. But I do find it interesting that they're handling it in a very, what we would call a very mature fashion, which is to say, this is what's available to you. This is what you can do. I'm not necessarily advocating it, but we can talk about it. We can discuss it. We can explore the subject further. And I definitely think that's a point worth emphasizing in this case, especially when it comes to the importance of context. And something I found super fascinating, you were kind enough to send me that incredible uh, Radio 4 uh, documentary interview about the Kama Sutras. And in that one, the people on there talked about 
how sex was perceived in the Hindu religion. And you talked about how people were prudish in the past. Another area what is still very known for being quite prudish today is religion. Like, it, the, me and you are both, both live in the Western world and Christianity is the key biggest religion in both of the nations we live in. Yes. And and this is good. You, you, obviously, this is kind of very funny when I say this, but God is never sexualized. Jesus is never sexualized. Oh, no, it, you couldn't least, be, it couldn't be any more taboo. No, exactly. It's the most prudish sort of thing, but... We see that the Hindu gods were seen as sex figures. A lot of the Hindu gods were seen as handsome men and, ha- and attractive women. And just sex was part of that culture. And you look back to, like, say, the Greek mythology as well. Sex was a big part of that. There wasn't, there was very little Zeus wouldn't try and have his way with. And it just shows this is that. very true. <laughs> it, just, it just shows that sex doesn't, sex and religion can intermingle with one another in a grown up, mature way. And it, and it doesn't need to be a prudish slap of the wrist sort of thing when we talk about it in t- context of religion. I just found that fascinating, especially with our with our Western impressions of religion, seeing it so differently here. I wonder if you had any more idea on how the Hindu religion intermixed with um, the Kama Sutra. So since we're talking about Vedic texts, uh, undoubtedly it's influencing this discussion on the on the part of the on the part of the author. Mm. I don't see how it couldn't. And the, the the example you brought up, from what I understand, is very true. I believe it was uh, Krishna who had a variety of relationships, I believe, even with married women, even though in terms of art, like sculptures, things like that, they're never portrayed in that fashion. Mm. But you certainly see it in the various Hindu epics, which are extraordinary, to say the least. And yeah, I think that's actually a very good, probably a very good reason why this is not nearly as taboo. And the whole th- the whole concept of this discussion is based in an inherent irony, which is to say we talk about the two histories that where it's originally written and the society it comes from in that time, even though it's private, you know, you're not it's not outlandish by any means. You can still have that discussion. It can still be a, a means of discourse. It's not pornographic. Mm. It's not pornographic. It has a distinct purpose to it. It's more than enjoying our jollies, as it were. <laughs> Whereas you go to the late 19th century and Richard Burton, and he's actively having to circumvent actual law to ensure that he and, and those that he is affiliated with in terms of the publication don't end up behind bars. So you're looking at two very, very different different societal views of the exact same topic interlinked in this most unusual way in terms of how they treat the subject, whereas this is something that would be available at the time it was written and, you know, not too long after, of course. In the case of Richard Burton bringing it back to Victorian England, he's always trying to skirt the law in terms of being able to translate it and distribute it. And I find that inherent irony absolutely captivating that is so true paul and just a final question i've got for you first how yeah. do you feel richard burton would feel about the karma sutra today because the thing that was so taboo has become so normalized today i think i think i've seen pop-up versions of the karma sutra for sale as like a joke gift how do you think he would see how do you think he would feel about how the karma sutra is known as now well, of course, as we mentioned prior, this would be pure speculation. Mm. Once again, just like I was talking about the actual author of the Kama Sutra, I don't think he would be surprised, but I kind of imagine he'd be a little disappointed. Mm-hmm. Because everybody knows, without a doubt, that sex sells. What it is, might as well live up to it because it's the reality of our world. Just wait till you see the thumbnail for this uh, episode on YouTube. See how many clicks that gets. <laughs> oh, baby. That is good. Oh, God, I haven't thought about that yet. I have to imagine to be a little disappointed because this is a guy who went to very long lengths to really get the flavor and the nuance of all of these cultures that he encountered. It, it was something that seemed, just based on my own appraisal of the man in question, that, well, he wouldn't be surprised because it doesn't take long for someone's attention to be taken right there. And especially now that there have been illustrations added to it, which I mentioned earlier was not part of the original package. You have to imagine to be a little disappointed uh, just because is that as far as you guys are going, you know, there's so much more to this. It offers such 
valuable insight into the time and place and it was written. I mean, I suppose when you look at it, the, the second book is still incredibly useful. I would have to imagine you'd be disappointed. I would be disappointed if I were Richard Burton in this case, because it tells you so much more than, than that, just that one book that's become famous. And you can't be surprised by it. I mean, especially with the proliferation of the internet, I, I, I think he'd have little trouble getting his mind around that concept 140 years down the road. But don't you think he'd be disappointed? Yeah, I guess so. Um, ex- yeah, I guess there would be some disappointment there. I think maybe part of it would be a chuckle, maybe, seeing that this is the part it's known for. But I know I think Richard Burton was a, a fascinated by this part of the world, as you mentioned. And like the Indian, but the, 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 the researchers you said you heard interviews from, they all sounded exasperated afterwards oh, yeah. by trying to explain this is more than just this is more than just some sex positions. I think he probably would be in the same camp as those guys. Yeah, that and when you start getting near the, the end of his life, apparently, according to his wife, he just had like stacks of ancient transcripts in his home, just just stacked up all over the place. This is a guy who took this stuff very seriously. This is a guy who, in, in another case, you know, is also known for being responsible for the translation of the Arabian Nights. This guy has definitely added a great deal to the culture and, and someone who definitely spent a great deal of his life trying to get into it. I mean, it, he's kind of an interesting figure because he's kind of an earlier version, but but much more exceptional in many ways uh, than T.E. Lawrence, who didn't speak very good Arabic when when he did what he did during the, during the First World War. And he's also, in a way, the, another figure that came to mind when I was thinking about Richard Burton, uh, though he would find this a great deal funnier, Sinjin Philby, who was the father of the infamous Kim Philby, which I'm sure you've probably heard the name before, Patrick. No, I haven't, actually. Uh, it might If you tell me who he was, it might spring to mind. But he was a uh, penetration double agent for the Soviet Union during the Cold mm-hmm. War and okay. MI6. Okay. Is this ringing a bell now? It's kind of, yeah. No, how interesting. So, yeah, yeah, sim- yeah. similarities there. Yeah, I don't think Sinjin Philby made quite the cultural impact, but he certainly did a great deal in the case uh, of Saudi Arabia, given his very personal relationship with uh, Ibn Saud, especially when it came to negotiating with the West when Saudi Arabia realized that they were sitting on a gold mine of oil, but that's that's beyond the point. Those are the two figures I think of. And in the case of Richard Burton, he's all three of them were obviously exceptional figures. But when I look at Richard Burton, if he saw what was happening right now, I think he'd just be disappointed, but not surprised. I'm trying to think of a great example. It, there, there's so many people in the creative world who are known for one thing in particular, and that's what everyone loves them for, but they can't stand them. I'm trying to think of a singer, not so much a one-hit wonder, but can you think of any bands who have loads of amazing songs, but everyone just wants to hear that one song over and over and over again? It's getting that sort of vibe from me. I'm trying to think of a great example, but nothing's coming to mind, unfortunately. But like, I don't know, say like a one hit wonder. Like you want to hear this one song, but like, I've made so many more good songs. This is the those ones. It's, it, that's the vibe I'm getting from like, don't remember me for this one thing. And this is a thing we can't, we don't get to dictate our legacies. They're, they're made for us after we pass away. Oh yeah, absolutely, and and the audience dictates it. Mm-hmm. The audience does dictate it as well. Um, you can try and do one thing, but if people want to remember you as one thing, they're going to remember you for that one thing. I mean, you know this as well as anybody being in YouTube. I mean, there has oh. to be videos that you thought, oh, this is going to be amazing, people are going to love it, and it didn't work out the way you thought. Then there's another video that you didn't think would have this great appeal, and it just takes off. Yes, um, and there's also the stuff that I know will do well, but I'm not the biggest fan of like, People love the country stuff. I'm not the biggest fan of talking about countries, but people love it. So I make those videos. Then I make videos I'm more into and they just don't unfortunately take off as well. It, there is a level of frustration to it for sure. But like you said, I'm not really in control of that. I make stuff for the people to enjoy and I don't want to disappoint the people. <laughs> no, no, of course not. You, you always have to somewhat play to the audience. I think the two examples I would give you, uh, both of which are from the 90s, in fact, are the crash test dummies and Harvey Danger. Mm -hmm. Those would be the two, especially Harvey Danger, who, from what I understand, will never perform Flagpole Sitta again, which is deeply unfortunate. Yeah. So 
I think the last time they may have done it was on on the eve of the year 2000, that New Year's Eve. But that's getting that's getting off course here. But nice. <laughs> when we come back, we're going to be getting into some really, really cool architectural history with Patrick. But if you want to help out the show, definitely go down and give a click for us to donate on Patreon, which of course we are immensely grateful. Or if you want to help out in another way, definitely give us a glowing five-star rating and review either on Apple Podcasts or wherever you enjoy your podcast most. Or if you're on YouTube, please definitely like, share, subscribe, comment. We want to hear from you. We love hearing from you. And all of that and more is incredibly helpful. You've done it so well so far. So please keep it up because we appreciate every one of you when you do that. And we'll be back right after a word from Anna Domini. This is the AD History Podcast. Keep up with the show and join the discussion by following AD History on Twitter with the handle at AD History PC and the hashtag AD History. Check us out over on Facebook, Instagram and YouTube by searching AD History Podcast, as well as, of course, tgnreview.com slash AD History Podcast. Also, check out the AD History Podcast on Patreon, See how you can help support the show and the rewards that await you by exploring the AD History podcast on Patreon. See the link in the description. Now, back to Paul and Patrick. And as always, Anna, bang up job. Every time, Paul. She, she, she says that every time and she gets it right exactly the same every time. It's like it's, it's weird to use one recording at the same time, but nope. She records it fresh every time for us. It's remarkable. The precision is absolutely befuddling. So he's, and if, on, if only I could be that accurate every time I get behind the mic. If only, Paul, if only. Same here. And But, of course, we must carry on with our uh, decade of 111 to 120. And Lead the way. My conversation is is somewhat similar, I suppose, to uh, the Kama Sutra in a very abstract way in... What we're both talking about today, Paul, I guess a theme might be preservation. They both are things, relics from this era of history that have been fortunate enough to have been preserved and give us a look into life at that time. That said, it's a bit of a tenuous bridge to, to the two topics, but it's there nonetheless. And you may remember, if you're a long time listener of AD History, if you are, if you are not, why not go back and listen to it? Uh, a while back, we looked into the construction of quite possibly Rome's most iconic landmark, the Colosseum. And today, we're looking into the construction of another famous landmark of Rome. Though this building isn't anywhere near as popular or well known as the Colosseum. In fact, I think your average person won't know of this building. Um, if you are someone to know a famous building in Rome, they might mention the Colosseum. They'll probably mention the Colosseum. They might mention the Vatican, although that's technically not Rome, but whatever. They might mention the Trevi Fountains, but I don't think anyone would talk about the Pantheon of Rome, unless it's someone like ourselves who knows their history or two. And while this building isn't as celebrated as the Colosseum or many other landmarks in Rome, it's of huge importance to us as not only have uh, many other buildings imitated it and if you look at pictures of this thing you'll see you, you've seen this building before because there's so many other buildings that look like it it's widely considered to be the best preserved building from ancient rome and construction is believed to have started on the pantheon during the time span of this episode of ad history so it's a great time to talk about it but oh yes absolutely but before we can really delve into this period of history we're looking at today, we have to go a little bit before because the construction of the Pantheon, we, we can't talk about it without talking about what came before it. And we have to go quite far back, even before AD. This story really begins in 31 BC. And initially, in the space where the Pantheon is now in Rome, there was an older temple built by Agrippa in 31 BC. And this temple was thought to be smaller in scope and size and this first temple got damaged in a fire in 80 AD and after this a second temple was built by Domitian um but however that one was too destroyed in 110 AD once again by fire fire in Rome 
didn't go well together. But that brings us on to... No, but they they definitely went together often enough. <laughs> no, yes, that's right. They did go together quite a bit, actually. Um, but anyway, 110 AD is when the second temple in this space got destroyed. And that, of course, brings us roughly up to where we're looking at today. And Trajan, who was emperor at this time, wanted to rebuild the Pantheon, built by a group that was lost to the fires. However, he died not too soon after its initial construction started. And the next emperor, Hadrian, who we'll be definitely be looking more into as we continue, he took over building this building. And it seems to have been something of a passion project for him. And he didn't just want to rebuild this temple, but he wanted to make it larger, more impressive, way more grand. And as a gesture of goodwill to the gods, he didn't put his name on it. So all buildings are attributed to someone. And this is something that makes it a bit trickier with this temple to know how old it is exactly. Because you would think it would have Hadrian's name on it, but he actually left Agrippa's name on it. He attributed it to Agrippa, who built the original temple. You know, it's interesting because we've actually come across this before in terms of the dedications of the building, where Domitian, despite the fact that he may simply be restoring or rebuilding a particular site, instead of giving credit to the person who actually originally commissioned the construction, he put it to himself. And clearly, Hadrian learned very well from Trajan, who definitely avoided this very tacky practice. But Hadrian himself learned well from his adopted father, Trajan. It's interesting to see how they, how this kind of plays into the bigger political picture that we've covered so far. That is really great. Thanks for adding that, Paul. And that is, this is literally a complete polar opposite. We've talked about the mission in the past and what, what a bad egg he was. And this shows you, and we talked about at the time as well, um, people wanted better rulers after the likes of the mission. We've talked about all these bad emperors in the past people were weary of them and they're showing us that rome was certainly something of a corner i guess with these good emperors as we talked about um a couple of episodes back as well but what was the pantheon used for and well we aren't a hundred percent sure on what exactly the use of the pantheon was but the popular idea is that it was a temple for not just one god in particular but it was for all the gods and that explains the name for us as well pantheon this comes from Greek and Pan means all and Theos means gods. And we still see Pan used in this way, meaning all today in language. Words like pansexual, that means attracted to all sexes. It, it's a word element that still appears in language today and we're seeing it here as well. And this idea was backed up by statues of multiple different gods all around the Pantheon being found. That's why many people believe it was a temple to every god, hence the name Pantheon. However, in more recent years, this idea has been debated. Another idea is that the Pantheon was built as a grand place emperors could stand and give speeches from and address the public, really making it little more than a big fancy backdrop for a speech. And personally, uh, that might be the reason why it's built, but I don't like that idea. You know, it's not if we just talked about Hadrian and Trajan being good emperors, this just doesn't really fit them as people. And another idea is that it was something of a dynastic century, though I'm not too sure what exactly that is. I just saw it described as that. And I guess it would be a place for the ruling class to reside and relax. I'm, I'm not too sure. But this idea I really enjoy is that it was also meant to double as a huge sundial. And if you th that might sound weird at first. How, how could a building be a sundial? But if you look at any picture of the Pantheon, you will notice the huge hole in the top of it. And that tracks the sun throughout the day. As the sun moves, there's this spotlight within the building that moves as well. And it's, it's really breathtaking. When I went to Rome, um, just sort of personal story, when I did go to Rome, I didn't know this building existed. I was one of these people who didn't know the building. But I left and it was my favourite building in the entire city. It really is quite a dramatic, dramatic thing. No, the Oculus is definitely something to behold. Mm -hmm. It really is. Yeah, we'll talk about it more in a moment. How exactly they got to build that Oculus, how exactly they built the Pantheon in general, because something obviously I always enjoy with looking at these sort of buildings, looking into the nitty gritty, the construction, the architecture of it all. So how was the Pantheon itself built? And construction is thought to have started in about 113 AD under the rule of Trajan, and materials would have been brought from all across the empire, uh, most noticeably, the pillars uh, arrive at the front of the building 
arrived in Egypt and they were dragged over the sands and actually floated up the Nile till they hit the Mediterranean and then brought into Rome that way, which I thought was amazing. Imagine just floating these pillars up the Nile. That's something to behold. People in the past are so seldom given proper credit when it comes to ingenuity mm, it, and, and the whole idea, oh, you know, they wouldn't have been capable of building it. Well, yes, they could. And necessity is the mother of invention. These folks knew how to do a whole lot. Never underestimate the folks in the past that much. If there's mm-hmm. anything you can take away from the show, in addition to many other core elements, don't underestimate the past. These people were not stupid. Believe me. And Some of them are really quite brilliant. This is a bit of a tangent, but if there's anything, what I love a good conspiracy theory myself. Obviously, who doesn't love a conspiracy theory? But I oh, yeah. cannot stand the conspiracy theory that aliens built the pyramids because not only are you put in these amazing people who built the pyramids to disservice, you know, that, that was built by slaves. Most of these old buildings were built by slaves. You know, people who didn't want to be doing that who were treated appallingly. And to just write them off as, oh, no, they didn't, aliens. It's just not fair on these poor people who suffered to build these things. It's just to rub it off as aliens did it. No, don't worry. I have a very low opinion of ancient aliens. Mm-hmm. I mean, some some of it I, I'll, I'll talk about with friends and family kind of in jest. Mm. But the fact of the matter is don't underestimate these people because a great deal of ingenuity, effort, suffering, mm. actual human lives went into their development. And there's no good reason we should have conspiracy theorists about it now. Believe me, they're a lot smarter than you thought. Yeah, they are a lot smarter than you thought. And the design of this temple was based on the temples of ancient Greece, which makes sense with that name. It had a Greek name, and it is a very Greek-looking building, but it was a vast improvement over those in Greece. And this, the Pantheon was seen as a result of century or so of architecture experimentation. Obviously, this is about... 40, 50 years since the Colosseum and stuff have come a long way with that. And the most impressive thing about it is its dome top. And this dome was applied layer by layer with heavier stones at the bottom and lighter stones on top. And we aren't sure as to how exactly they kept this dome centered as they built it. We have a couple theories. One's more like a legend or myth, but the popular theory is that they use sort of like wooden rings that they built around it. And as they built it, they sort of removed these wooden rings just to keep it aligned as they put it all on top. And the other legend, and um, I adore this legend, I think you'll probably get kicked out of this as well, Paul, is that while it was being built, Hadrian demanded that the Pantheon be filled with this huge mound of dirt. If you can picture that, imagine like an open cylinder full of dirt and like it's domed at the top and then the dome could be built around this dirt, if that makes any sort of sense. Yes. And then to get rid of the dirt, Hadrian put small amounts of gold all tucked away within this dirt to make sure that people will come and get rid of it. I just think that's such a fun, such a fun, silly idea. I can't imagine how much truth there is in it. Ooh. But I read that and I just thought that was a really fun idea. Boy, if that's true, that is absolutely astonishingly creative. I love it. Yeah, I, I really enjoy it. Listen, it's just a fun legend I thought I'd add in there. But it's more just how it's built that makes this building so impressive. It's a very, the, the, the term I use for it, it's a very geom- geometrically pleasing building. Just to look at it, it's a nice looking building. It's It's got a really circular and square design. It's made of two main areas. There's a rectangular part at the front. These do have fancy architect name. If there's any architects watching, I'm sure they will know the correct terms of the, the, these parts of the building, but it's got like this rectangular bit at the front and like its circle, uh, cylindrical part at the back with that dome on top. And what's amazing about this dome that I've rattled on about for far too long now, it's the largest unsupported concrete dome in the world. And the fact it's still standing to this day is remarkable and the interior design of the pantheon makes it a perfect sphere it's really hard to explain but the inside is like with the statues inside it makes it like you're standing in the middle of a ball it really is quite impressive and at the center of the dome is as you mentioned paul as i've mentioned Mm. the oculus and is this opening in which sunlight can come through and just so much precision and care went into its creation in example so on the top of the dome there's these uh, panels, sunken panels, and there's 28 of those. And th- like I said, this is going into the world of Roman maps, but 28 was seen as this really important number 
to the Roman. So, you know, thought like that went into it. It's just so elegantly made, but it's a simple, timeless design as well. And you really have to see it to appreciate it. I'm sure we can put some pictures up on our social media of it because it's absolutely breathtaking. I might even have some of my own pictures that I took while I was there to share with you guys. It really is a wonderful Oh, that'd building. be incredible. Mm, I, I can't promise I'm in them. I think it was just some snaps I took way back. You know, gosh, it was almost, it feels like, it feels like a lifetime ago. But then yesterday feels like a lifetime ago at the moment, Paul. Oh, tell me about it. <laughs> but what I want to talk about quickly as well is the Pantheon's modern uses, because the Pantheon is still being used to this day. It was taken over by the Catholic Church in 609 AD and is also known as the Basilica of St. Mary and Martin to this day. Some former kings of Italy have been laid to rest in the Pantheon and you can even get married there to this day. I'm sure it costs a pretty penny, but if you want to go get married in one of the most wonderful buildings in Rome, go for it. I'm just sure you have the cash. And... As I mentioned, so many other buildings has been inspired by the Pantheon. And the most noticeable of these is the Rotunda at the University of Virginia, which was, of course, designed by Thomas Jefferson. It's widely believed that he was inspired by the Pantheon when he made this, when he designed this building. And there's also the Low Library at Columbia University. Again, looks incredibly like the Pantheon. And the Reading Room at the British Museum, which I couldn't find an outside picture of it, but from the inside, once again circular building same for the state library in victoria and melbourne well something i would also mention and if you're bringing up thomas jefferson mm. and the rotunda at uva and by extension the the replica rotunda down at smu mm. it's definitely worth mentioning that thomas jefferson's personal estate monticello has a great many of these architectural qualities as well which is actually very close to the uva campus down in charlottesville mm. thank you for sharing that with us <laughs> and you see it's just how inspired people were by this building and Michelangelo supposedly even studied the Pantheon before he got to work on St Peter's and if you look at St Peter's and you look at the Pantheon you will see a similarity there and the, the, the rule of thumb this is what I've sort of said to wrap things up here is that anything with a domed top or remotely circular can probably claim to be influenced by the Roman Pantheon and that's just what I wanted to talk about today, Paul, this incredible building that has really stood the test of time, not only with the fact it's still there, but it's just inspired so many more people. I, I, I've got a fascination about Roman buildings, Paul, you shouldn't notice yet, and just construction in the past in general. And this is just a great example of more construction. It would be hard to miss. Mm. And that, that's for sure. It would be hard to miss. <laughs> this is just a great example of how we built things in the past and how we've made them stand the test of time. No, definitely. And something I want to go back on, because we were talking about a little bit earlier about what was the purpose of the Pantheon? Now, if I remember correctly, this was originally firstly commissioned by Trajan, though he never lived to see its completion, correct? Yes, yes. So Hadrian is interesting in this respect. So even though he didn't commission it, it's something that he would have had a tremendous amount of interest in because he ended up getting a very interesting moniker. We talked about this a little bit in the interview we did with Ryan Stitt mm. in our last episode, which is among the inner circle of power and the various elites of Rome that would have had access to Hadrian. He ended up getting an interesting nickname, which was the, the Greek link or the little Greek because of his incredible fascination and patronage of Greece under Roman control. And so when I look at this and, and you consider just how many of the Greek gods were borrowed by the Romans and incorporated into their belief system, into their religion, that in the case of Hadrian, I could be wrong about this, but I have to imagine he would find it a little vulgar that this would just have a definitive political purpose. You have to imagine that might have been somewhat serendipitous. Obviously, now there's some scholars that are, are making greater, much more emphasis on its political value, that it could act as a, a very stately backdrop for addressing the masses or whatever gathering it happened to be. And of course, when you go through history, you know that politics and religion are almost invariably intertwined. To me, it's kind of hard to imagine that Hadrian would have thought of it 
through the vulgarity of, of politics. That is something that just kind of developed over time. And I'm curious what your thoughts are on that. I think there might be some stock in that. Like I said, it was just one idea as to why the Pantheon was thought to have been built. And I don't like the idea that it was built just as an impressive backdrop, as I mentioned. And from what we know about Hadrian, he doesn't seem like the kind who would want that. Like you said, he was a big lover of uh, Greek, Greece, you know, everything Greek, which does explain to us perhaps why it was built to be a temple for all the gods. As you said, Greece had many gods, many of which Rome adopted. But it also explains to us why the building had such a Greek style. As I mentioned, it was built to be in the Greek style, but more improved. And that was probably something of Hadrian's doing, perhaps when Trajan wanted to build it. And of course, the temples that stood there before it, built by Domitian and Agrippa, they probably didn't look as Greek either. Well, it's interesting because one of the reasons I love that you chose this topic is that it so perfectly intertwines to so many of the big points that you and I have covered, especially politically as it relates to ancient Rome in this early imperial period. Like, for example, the fact that it was commissioned by Trajan, who obviously made a very big point in his domestic policy to rebuild Rome, and th this would be an ideal candidate. You can really understand why he chose this path that he did in doing it, and then, of course, it being overseen by Hadrian. But let's get more into the foundation all pun intended, of the subject. And I'm curious, what is the big reason that the Pantheon was so well preserved and so many other buildings of its time have not endured nearly as well? Paul, I'm glad you asked. It, it ties into, once again, to what we've been talking about a lot this episode. What is perhaps one of the one things that was present in the time of Rome that is still present on this planet to this day? Religion. Religion is undoubtedly the reason why. And we don't often think about this. Religion just seems like this thing that always will and always has been. But that is true that th these base ideas, these sort of base belief systems were there then and they're still here now. And we have buildings, you know, people have buildings of worship and they're always going to need buildings of worship. They're always going to need to be well maintained and looked after. And as the Pantheon, and once again, this leans into the idea that the Pantheon wasn't this fancy backdrop for, Rome, for, for rulers. It was a place of worship, a place of religion. It shows us that it was well cared for because people always needed someone to worship. As we saw, it was in 609 AD. I might have got that a bit mixed up. Yeah, 609 AD it was taken over by the Catholic Church. People just wanted somewhere to worship. It was a wonderful building. It was well maintained because see, people simply always had a need for it we talked about the Colosseum in the past and as we mentioned the Colosseum is so derelict in, in, in such a poor state I mean obviously it's not in awful disrepair but it's because gladiatorial games fell out of fashion and the Colosseum was just left to waste away but with religion always being a popular thing doesn't matter what religion it is we need those buildings it stayed well well maintained as its function didn't fall out of fashion. At least that's what I read, and that's that's the argument I strongly believe anyway. No, I think there's definitely a lot to that. Mm. And of course, given the inherent religious interest, they're also going to do a great deal to maintain it, as it did in the hands of the Catholic Church, who would have a distinct desire to make sure that it remains intact and in good repair. The Catholics love a fancy building, Paul, that's for sure. <laughs> well, they are not alone. They are not they alone. They adore a big fancy building, and the Pantheon is just that. But that's all I have. Do you have any more questions at all, Paul? As a matter of fact, I, I definitely do. But I, I'm curious as to your thoughts now, now that we've gotten a great deal more informed about ancient Greece under Roman control. If you are looking through the eyes of Trajan and later Hadrian, what is it about this this Greek classical architecture that has not just the presence and its aesthetic quality as we see it? Oh, that is a very, very alluring, very attractive building to look at. How would you say that Greece really influenced all this and their desire to really build in a Greek fashion? I guess people are like people have an innate interest in the old. And what came from, you know, we're fascinated by stuff in the past. People are always taking inspiration from what happened in the past. 
And you, by the time of Rome, the Greek architecture was already there and it was nearby, I guess. And they just saw it. They probably just saw it as this classical ancient building look and they were drawn to that. Who wouldn't be? It's gorgeous to look at. I imagine that would have been one of the reasons. Of course, Greece, I've heard the great saying that the Greeks were thinkers and the Romans were doers. And the, the, the buildings of ancient Greece have this association of high intelligence, of philosophy, of big thinking, that sort of thing. So perhaps they wanted to, hope, hopefully Rome thought, hey, if we use this building style as well, people might have that image of us as well, possibly. That's just off the top of my head as an idea as why Rome might have been so into the Greek design architecture. And it may well explain its later influence in neoclassical architecture as well. Mm -hmm. Just Greece has such an alluring image to it. Ancient Greece, everyone, if you are, I think most people know about ancient Greece. It's such a well-known, well-beloved mythology and part of history. It's hard not to fall in love with the design, the architecture of it all, really. Even if today in the neoclassical or even back with the Romans, pun intended, it's a classic. <laughs> Oh, of that there is absolutely no doubt. Well, thank you, Patrick. That was, as always, brilliant. And we'll be back right after this. This is the AD History Podcast. Anyway, I think that brings us to the end of our journey for today. Patrick, where can people find us? You can find me personally on Twitter at NameExplainYT. And of course, you can find me on my YouTube channel, NameExplain. And for myself, you can find me on my newly minted Twitter account at the handle at PKD in History. Also, take a peek at my reader email submitted Q&A column, the World War II Brain Bucket over on TGNR. We have a link down in the description. If you enjoy AD History and you want to support the show, be sure to leave a glowing five-star review. Or if you're on YouTube, like, share, and subscribe. AD History really does depend on listeners like you leaving reviews and ratings to help support it. Now over to Anna to properly send you guys home. Thank you for listening and goodbye. Yes, thank you for listening. Be well. Until next time. Like all good things, we come to an end for today. Thank you for listening to the AD History Podcast. It is listeners such as yourself who make this show possible and truly awesome. Be sure to follow and subscribe for upcoming AD History Podcast episodes, available wherever podcasts are found. Also, follow AD History on social media. Follow the show on Twitter at the handle at AD History PC, as well as on Facebook by visiting facebook.com slash AD History Podcast and Instagram as AD History Podcast. In addition to liking and subscribing on YouTube by searching AD History Podcast. Do you have a direct comment or question for Paul and Patrick? Drop them an email at AD History Podcast at tgnreview.com. Also, be sure to visit the show's homepage at tgnreview.com slash adhistorypodcast. For Paul and Patrick, thank you for listening to AD History. We'll see you again next time in the ever-growing tapestry of world history.